Someone once asked Mel Whiteson, what does it mean to become a priest? And he said, it's a more involved fabric situation. <laughs> <laughs> Can we sing a little song? Yeah, we'll do opening chant here. Right? Yeah. yeah, okay. Call and response. The Dharma is fast and subtle. The Dharma is fast and subtle. We now have a chance to see this. We Descendants from colonizers, we uh, most of us, I imagine, um, uh, are here because of the way that is paved through colonization, and for us to um, bear the impacts and the responsibility of that um, in our daily lives, and also uh, extending that to um, being most of us, I imagine, being recent-ish converts. <laughs> so to speak, to the extent that you're a convert, but uh, practitioners of a uh, um, worldview uh, and practice paradigm that was uh, conceptualized and fostered and developed in uh, South Asia and East Asia, and to bear in mind the uh, responsibility of that and to not approach that with um, a sense of entitlement or any kind of hubris or any kind of... Um, uh, um, uh, neglect in honoring the um, genius of our uh, spiritual ancestors. Um, in our attempts to <clears throat> modernize it and make it relevant, we can make it relevant without saying um, that, that our ancestors were foolish or something like that, or misrepresenting. So in that vein, I wanted to uh, talk about um, this thing that I think is one of the um, the side effects of Zen, of the Zen tradition being kind of a distilled tradition. You know, you can think of the Zen tradition as being kind of a distilled tradition, I think, as apart from the kind of a broader, um, Buddhist tradition. You know, uh, when you study or encounter Tibetan Buddhism or Theravadan Buddhism or Chinese Mahayana Buddhism, it might seem like there's um, kind of a lot to know and a lot of moving parts and uh, a, 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 a broader multitude of practices. And then when you encounter not just Japanese Zen, but Japanese Zen as it's presented um, in this country and in Europe, it seems like it's very kind of streamlined for simplicity. You know, and some people get really excited about that. Like, you know, Zen, they really cut out the fat and they get rid of all the cultural trappings, which is a super racist state on, on all of Buddhist culture. Um, and um, and uh, they just really, uh, they just sit and they clarify the mind. Um, having encountered, so I've been in the biz, <laughs> for a couple decades, and I've encountered a lot of teachers. Um, 
and, uh, and I've encountered teachers that um, passed all the Colin curriculum and got their verification from their teacher and were direct descendants of the authentic lineage. And um, so far from what I've seen, and I've also, you know, uh, encountered uh, reincarnate tulkus and rinpoches and, and, um, and lamas and things, and people had a very, very traditional education, people who's were, you know, preordained to not need that education by the merit of the reincarnation to the system. Um, and uh, the, from what I can tell, there isn't a realization that um, And it's tricky because this is not exactly what the texts say. And I just told you all to really <laughs> not negate <laughs> the tradition to, to suit your 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 um, what's it called? your uh, disposition. But but based on evidence from what I've seen in the living world, the people that I've encountered, uh, it's not so much this thing like you practice just right, and then all of a sudden. All the dominoes fall and all the mouse traps go off and the light switches on and the bell goes off and, and boom, you uh, know how to act. Um, I wish it were that way. It would be so much yeah. easier. Yeah. Yeah, it seems it seems like it, it should or could be. In fact, uh, and I also, um, one of my experiences is that uh, the more enthusiastic uh, a teacher is about um, this experience of uh, seeing true nature, uh, usually the worst behave, and from what I've experienced. Um, um, because there's uh, putting a lot of eggs in that basket of that one cataclysmic event to kind of develop you in all of these multifaceted ways. And actually, if you uh, want to get good at shot put, you practice shot put. You know, I don't know where that came from. <laughs> you know, if you want to get good at making an omelet, you practice making an omelet. You know, like I saw this footage because I like to see footage of Gordon Ramsay um, being out of his element and embarrassed or something really satisfying to me about that. <laughs> Gordon Ramsay is a celebrity chef who's very mean to people. Um, and there's a there's a, some footage of him trying to make dumplings in a Chinese restaurant, and he just can't. He just is really bad. You know, and here's this guy in his own realm, massively arrogant and self-possessed and confident and stuff like that. And you put him in another realm and, it, and it's a very adjacent to the thing that he is most proficient at. It's just one degree away and he can't do it. You know, so what if uh, uh, being relational is one degree away of the true nature that you've encountered? You know, are you... Does that, does that faculty translate, you know? And now this is not something that was lost in the early Buddhist tradition. That's why we have the precepts and that's why we have um, uh, a lot of uh, kind of contemplative practices that were kind of, that's part of the fat that was cut out of the American Zen tradition. You know, but I don't know about, you know, sometimes when people take Jukai, they kind of, they practice the precepts. Maybe they'll read the, there's the, the holy trinity of precepts. So you got your waking up to what you do by Aishin Rosetto. You've got your being upright by Rev Anderson. And you got your mind of clover by Robert Aiken. Usually, so you, you, maybe you go to a study group for a few months or a year, and you talk about the book, and then you go to Jukai. But mostly it's kind of like, for most people, it's kind of like, I want to... It's more about becoming a Buddhist in the sense of identity, or it can be about this kind of thing of like almost kind of like the Hindu or yogic uh, diksha ceremony where you're kind of becoming an apprentice of a teacher. It can kind of become that little thing. Because the East Asian educational paradigm is very much master and apprentice. It's not the way Buddhism's largely be part. I mean, we talk about the lineage and we talk about the ancestors. That kind of thing is developed more in a cohort rather than this one-to-one -one thing. Zen's got this weird thing where one person says that you deserve no transmission you get. You know, that doesn't really happen in Theravada Buddhism. That doesn't really happen in Tibetan Buddhism. You can't really kind of, it's, it's a more of a, a quorum that's set aside. You know? 
and you get, um, and like even in, in contemporary Soto Zen, if you weren't practicing, because there's kind of two kinds of Soto Zen temples in the US. You got your Soto Zen missions, and then you have your Zen centers. And your Zen centers are largely white, largely convert community, kind of very meditation oriented. Don't bring your kids, you know. Um, and, a, and a Buddhist temple is not really like that. A Buddhist temple is a place for a family to come and observe Buddhist cultural activities together. You know, sutra copying, pounding mochi, dances, you know. Um, Dharma school, you know, kind of like catechism. Sunday school, yeah. Um, and um, what's the point of that? Oh, so if you wanted to get Jukai, um, either actually, I remember Zen Shuji, such as I mentioned in Los Angeles, but you get their newsletter. And in the back, there's a little, um, I don't know if they do that so much, where, you know, like little mini mailers that would get stapled into a little newsletter. And it had a little envelope there. And it's like, application for Jukai. You know, and there's a little, and you, you're not, it's not about you establishing your relationship to a teacher. You know, it's about um, you um, saying, um, you know, on a, on a cursory or superficial level, you could say, it's, 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 this is, I'm joining this temple. I'm being part of the club. I'm being part of the bib club. I say, I go there, there's the people with the bibs, they're senior to me, I want to be one of the bib people too. You know? <laughs> um, but at its best, it's, you know, the primary teaching of this tradition, of the old Buddhist tradition, not just as a tradition. Sometimes we view ourselves as some kind of, like, not really part of Buddhism, you know. Um, but the, the primary practice of the, of the Buddhist tradition, the first and foremost thing that you do, is that you take refuge, you know. And it's kind of on a way of, you know, setting up your orientation and saying, my life's about this. My life's about this now. You know, um, and usually for adults that weren't born into it, that my life about this now is the result of life according to me has had very mixed results. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like the, what I've done with the freedom that I've been given has had very mixed results. And, and, and I, maybe I've been harmful, maybe I haven't been harmful, maybe everybody thinks I'm great, but there's a way that it feels that I want to do something. You know. And so there is technology and there is practice to support us to do something about it beyond sitting still, beyond sitting still and trying to see the true nature. There's a, in fact, I think if you had a choice between doing um, these uh, four thoughts that turn the mind towards the Dharma, I'm going to offer you some four traditional kind of contemplative practices. Uh, to support our orientation towards practice. If you were going to, if someone said, okay, I only want to do a handful of things in my life. I'm going to either do Shikantaza or do koan practice or practice the precepts and, and do the contemplative practice of the four thoughts that turn me towards the Dharma. I'm like, do the last one. The last one's gonna gonna have a more um, palpable effect on um, how you feel about your life and how you, and how you work with others. I think you know, and I think sometimes Zen is approached as like it's kind of um, well, what's my motivation? My motivation is I want to understand reality, or I want to understand myself, or I want to have an awakening experience, or something like that. And then everything's gonna feel better. Um, uh, I've been with people that have had awakening experiences and I've seen them be frustrated, I've seen them be depressed, I've seen them be mad. It's pretty similar. Post-awakening life is pretty similar to pre-awakening life. So you need to bolster it with all of the other things. You know, there's a story of Maizumi Roshi um, uh, who was gardening in, his front, in the front yard of the Zen Center of Los Angeles and a unhoused, you know, an inebriated person that's having, you know, a rough time comes up to me in, in kind of somewhat slurred speech. What is it like to be the white man? And he's in Roshi. Because he saw the, the Asian man with the bald head and said, this must be the Roshi. In this case, he was right. And my husband goes, it's depressing. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
how to um, uh, give ourselves access to um, the broader scope of this tradition that uh, I think through the kind of um, hubris and branding, I mean, there was branding um, going on 800 years ago and 1,000 years ago, someone setting up a school and going, my school's about this, in my school we do this and we don't do that. You know, not only do we not do that, but doing that is very, very backwards. You know, so Kamakura Buddhism, uh, which is about early 1200s to 1300s, just a hundred year time span, you got a multitude of individual schools come up, centered around one practice, and in effect, kind of dismembering Buddhism. Now, it had a pragmatic reason for that happening. There was a time, the late Heian period, right before the Common Court period, I'm doing that project thing again. Where I start sounding like a professor and saying, we have to talk, and I think it alienates people. I had this remorse yesterday. That was very intellectual. Um, but, I like it, but okay. that's just my <laughs> Okay, so late Heian period was a time of civil war and famine in Japan. This is the late 1100s, you know, and, and Buddhism was this thing that was very um, specialized and rarefied, and you had to go to an educational center and learn all the damn things, and you had to learn, um, I remember like Honen's teacher said, well, before you go off on retreat, you really got to learn the this, this, and this text. And then, and I'm reading his biography and he said, so 12 years later, <laughs> you know, that's, that's what it took to get a Buddhist education, you know, and there's something that needs to be addressed or confronted or redirected about that. There's something, it needs to be accessible. People are starving. What does Buddhism mean to them? So then you have Honen, you have Shinran, and they go out into the world and they say, just say non-monimu Buddhism and trust that you'll be reborn. And what's the efficacy of that? Efficacy of that is creating a, a person that is um, relaxed and entrusted. You know, they've entrusted their minds to, to a leader. And what happens when you entrust your minds, when you quote unquote let go and let God? It takes a lot of the burden off of your shoulders because none of this shit's in your control anyway. You know, most of it. You know, so there is other power. And then the message of the Bhagavad Gita is just like, Go ahead and act, but don't worry too much. Don't get so excited about the results because they may not pan out. But act, act to the best of your ability. Um, so there was a necessity for a kind of condensing and streamlining, but then it's just kind of like, you know, over the generations, it's just kind of like, what? I wonder if we lost anything important. You know, in taking the precepts seriously, because I, I lived for a while at a Chinese Buddhist monastery. And when lay people take the precepts at a Chinese Buddhist monastery, they actually like think that means that that's how they have to act now. Mm -hmm. So they, they'll they take their version of Jukai and they literally don't drink anymore. You know, and they literally don't eat meat. You know, and I was just like, wow, this is, um, um, and, and that's the primary practice. And it's, and it's like, well, um, you can meditate all you want, but really, if you drink any meat, what are you doing? You're not really a Buddhist. <laughs> you know, from a Chinese, from a Chinese Mahayana point of view. You know? um, the vegetarian thing is more of an East Asian preoccupation than uh, Himalayan and South Asian and South Asian. Um, and uh, insisting on vegetarianism can be uh, ableist. Because it doesn't suit everybody's um, constitution. So I just want to acknowledge that instead of it sounding like I'm from the radio. Um, so let's get into these practices. Any questions so far? What's your Kai? Oh! Yeah. Get what out you're of doing? here. Yeah. Um, I know, I'm just... Thank you, thank you. Yeah, it's hard for me to... I don't know. But this has been the beginning and end of my... My whole adult life has been in the Buddhist world. So sometimes I say things and I don't even realize that it's not common parlance. You know? So Jukai, Ju means to... I, I don't remember if it's to give or receive. But I mean, same diff. And then um, Kai means uh, precepts. So, and actually, before I encountered Buddhism, I never really heard the word precept. Apparently, it's an English word that means something in English, and 
and has a meaning outside of the Buddhist context. I'd never heard it before. So precept is like um, a, a little vow that you take, um, or a big vow that you take, uh, or, or a set of vows that you take. So in the lay Buddhist tradition in our, in our school, you take what we call the 16 bodhisattva precepts, which is really just 10 bodhisattva precepts, and then you tack on a couple clusters of three that just kind of reiterate with 10. But there's 10 prohibitory precepts. In, um, in the Tibetan tradition, they call them the 10 non-virtues, because it's like doing these things are not virtuous. You know? And so the idea here being that um, if you live um, a life where you're working with your behavior, specifically around these 10 specific behaviors, and they are, and you might need to have Don't kill. Oops. Don't steal. Don't take what is not. Which is a little bit more nuanced than don't steal. Mm -hmm. um, because I remember one time I was traveling with um, Ajahn Amaro, who was the, at the time the abbot of the uh, Aigiri Forest Monastery here in California. And we went to Pete's Coffee. I don't know if they have mm -hmm. that here. Mm -hmm. It's like a Berkeley thing, Pete's Coffee. Um, and I got him, I'm like, are you allowed to tell me what you want? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, I have a latte. <laughs> so I go get him a latte, but I have to hand it to him. If I set it down on the table, he can't assume that it's for him. You know, he has to take it out of my hands. You know, that's how strictly they follow the precepts. Um, and, um, so not taking away is not given, uh, not lying. Um, not, uh, I'm out of order now. Using, That's the first three. Abusing drugs and alcohol. Yeah, abusing sexuality. Yeah, from intoxicants and tox uh, sexuality, not misusing sexuality, <laughs> which for monastics historically was not, not having a sex life at all. Um, uh, not praising self at the expense of others, not being stingy. There's one that's just like, don't be stingy. Um, not harboring ill will, that's my favorite. Cultivate letting let it standard. go, do not attach to anything, even the teaching. Which one's that? I cultivate letting go. I've never heard that. It, maybe that's a different transition. Of yeah. Maybe that's a don't be stingy one. It's don't be stingy. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, do you all do the full moon ceremony where you, yes. do, where you hear the Dogen commentaries? There is an ocean of bright clouds and an ocean of illuminated clouds. <laughs> What does that even mean? Right. Um, <laughs> That's my favorite ceremony. It's a good one. Yeah. yeah, so taking these things to heart, you know, so there's a ceremony where you formally vow publicly because actually, if you say you're going to do something out loud in front of people, it means more. Mm -hmm. As anybody that's ever quit alcohol can tell you. Um, so, um, and the idea being here that you are starting to behave as if you understand that this isn't all about you and all about your um, kind of uh, uh, sort of constricted um, uh, preoccupation with um, your own gain, you know, in a very superficial way. Actually, the great gain, you have all the great gain. You're well within your rights to want to believe you deserve to do everything you can to get it. But usually we're not so interested in the great gain. We're interested in the kind of the quick and easy game, you know. Um, and most of us don't know of anything else, actually, you know, rather than the great game. Um, so the great game is um, this uh, great relinquishing of the preoccupation of the game. And so I said something yesterday in a guided meditation. I think where it's something like the extent to which you care about yourself is the extent to which you don't want things to suffer. So every way that you go to bat for yourself in your own life is totally valid in the name of ending suffering. You know, but then there's a way where that little dime can turn around, um, you know, wanting to, wanting to uh, elicit praise, wanting to uh, be well regarded sometimes at the expense of others. I do that a lot sometimes. Because I got a little chip on my shoulder that I was like a little young Zen teacher, and I'm, sometimes I'm trying to kind of dethrone my elders or something like that, so that people will think I'm as good as they ever were. Because I don't have a book, and you know, I'm not in tricycle. Or <laughs> Huge issue. Um, and my take on it is something that a lot of my elders don't really um, appreciate. 
So then that's a real no. Um, because the orthodox thing doesn't really work for me actually so much. You know? I have ADHD. I'm not gonna. They kept telling me, oh, if you sit still, the thoughts go away. I'm like, no, it's, it's been 18 years. <laughs> well, try harder. Maybe, maybe you're wrong. Um, so, so that gave me the weird flavor that I have. Anyway, what that was I talking about? Uh, Jukai, oh, they're taking it seriously. So there's this whole network of support available to us, apart from, you know, Bodhidharma's whole special transmission outside of the scripture, which means don't, don't get help outside of your own teacher. Uh, is the way that that's been modernly interpreted to an extent, which is which is a bad idea. Very bad. Um, uh, special transmission outside of scriptures, directly pointing to the human heart and seeing your true nature, and that's been the Zen motto, which means that um, everything helpful uh, you should ignore. Uh, I I think that might not be a great approach. Um, so. Now, for reals, let's get into the um, the four thoughts, which is the topic of the talk at eleven oh eight. Okay, so the four thoughts that turn the mind towards the dharma. Okay, so why? Why the four thoughts that turn the mind towards the dharma? Because if your motivation is just oh, I want to see my true nature, that gets very, very abstract, you know. And like, there's this thing that we were talking about yesterday, where okay, so even with that instruction. Even with like, okay, I, I, I'm going to just like sit still and see what happens and I'm going to watch my breath or something like that, or I'm going to keep my spine straight. And you have, there's some kind of, um, even though there's more nuanced instructions like that, that could give you a little bit of a better go of this, I think. Even if you're just doing that, it's not like it's worth nothing. So you're going to get some kind of impact of that. And there's even just like taking time to rest. I remember asking um, when I was starting a Zen center in New Orleans, I asked Zenju Earthland Manual, I'm like, what advice do you have about what, I, what, what I'm trying to create? And she's like, create a place where people can rest. Um, and so even if Zazen is just merely this exercise in rest or this exercise in developing patience with yourself, that alone is very, very worth it. You know, but this thing can happen that when everything materially that's satisfying you in all the easy ways is just coming together just right, then you're not front loading that development. You're not front loading that practice. You know, you can have, uh, you can be having a nice time and not really worry about this stuff so much. You know, and then when the shit hits the fan again, you're like, oh, I remember what I need to do. You know, taking that rest, taking that, that patience dose. You know? But so part of this training um, is some, some schools call this a training in renunciation. Um, but the, the Tibetan word for renunciation, uh, oh gosh, I forget what it is, but it translates to definite emergence. You know, it's not like that's the flip side of it. So we think we hear renunciation, we're like, oh, there's all this stuff that we have to give up so that we could become heroes of some sort. But it's actually, um, this is the path towards definitely emerging from the kind of mire of how, how life can feel sometimes. Not always. And that's the tricky thing about it, that it's not always. If it was always, it'd be really easy to keep your eye on the prize a little bit more, but it's not always. Yeah. So these are the things that um, in some schools of practice um, are front and center. This is how you begin every session. This is what you're meditating on for the first two years. Um, and these are contemplative practice. So other some so it's in terms of, you know, from the Zen school, sometimes we think. But if you're sitting there thinking you're not meditating, Zen has this like kind of strong thing. Meditating is not thinking, or it's letting thoughts come and go, or whatever. But it's not actively thinking. This is a type of meditation where you are actively introducing ideas so that you're turning them around in your own head. And this is called analytical meditation or contemplative practice. It is part of the Buddhist tradition. Lost a lot of traction in Zen. Um, so the first thought that turns the mind towards the Dharma is the precious human life. So you have a precious human life. And I remember um, kind of, um, I don't know, I was always short 
I was always unathletic and I kind of was always waiting for the physicality to let me participate in life the way that I wanted to. And it just kind of never came like, oh, I can't play basketball. I'm not grown yet. Or, you know, or something like that kind of feeling. Like, I don't have the tools to do the thing. You know, and maybe sometimes you have this kind of feeling. There's that little couple of days of dissonance when you first get your driver's license. It's like, I can go somewhere. I can actually go somewhere. Or if you get your first job, I remember getting my first debit card. And you're like, I'm going to go buy lunch. I'm taking myself out to lunch. I'm grown now and I can do that, you know, and there's this way that we you uh, feel empowered to do the thing, you know, and the precious human life is like, okay, you want to do Buddhism, you are already have what you need, you got what you need, you got this precious human life, you know, some Tibetan schools, they call it the PHR, the precious human rebirth, um, but what's the benefit of meditating on the precious human life, it helps to give you confidence and energy, you know, that um, this stuff is designed for someone that's in precisely your situation, mm -hmm. that precisely has the tools that you currently have. And you're not waiting f to, for some kind of download for some kind of unique special ability. The ability is there. For instance, raise your hand if you can hear me. So you have awareness. That is, that is the wakeful mind. That is the mind that we're talking about all the time. You know, um, and if you didn't raise your hand because you couldn't hear me, that is also awareness. <laughs> that is also the wakeful mind. Because you would have, have had to have had awareness to even rock that you didn't hear me. So that is also uh, wakefulness. So that's the tool. <clears throat> but if you don't recognize that you have that tool, there's going to be constantly this feeling of something's missing. Like, I can't, I can't apply for that job. I don't have the thing. You know, or I can't play that game, or I can't ask that person out, or whatever little thing is this weird kind of like roadblock with Buddhism, with Buddhist practice, you got it. If you're hearing this, you got it. So you don't have to wait, you don't have to feel like something's missing. You know, um, then another thing is to actually touch base with this thing that we're taking for granted, which is um, what being alive gives you. Um, and it's this, uh, since we don't have anything to compare it to, and since it's all we've ever known, there's my, one of my favorite comedians, Julian Barrett from uh, the UK. He said, someone said, how's life? He goes, I don't know. I don't have anything to compare it to. Um, but to just to take some time and just to think of all the all the experience that you can have that why would you even have this experience why what are the odds that you would even be here do you know how big the universe is you know you know how many varieties so first of all what are the odds of ever being embodied as a sentient being you know and then you think about the variety of sentiments what are the odds of not being an ant you know what are the odds of being a person what are the odds of being a person that is not born in a time of great well, I mean, we can say, oh, things, things are worse than ever, but like in our immediate life, there's, there's a lot greater daily impact of suffering that we could be experiencing than what we're experiencing. You know, we're not fearing for our lives every moment of the day, you know. Um, starving to death. We're not starving to death, you know. Um, so, um, So to take some time, and it's not, um, it's not selfish or patting yourself on the back to touch base with the miracle of being an embodied person, you know, having your precious human life. And so appreciating everything good that's happened in your life, because there was, it's a zero sum game. There's no reason any of that could have happened. You know, it was, and um, and so the practice would be. And you could do this, you know, as if you wanted to do this for a year and just put your whatever you've been calling Zazen aside and do this for a year or do this at the beginning of every period. Sit down and go through, okay, precious human life, you know, and you have this open awareness, sitting in open awareness, but when it occurs to you, um, what are the odds that, that I would be here doing this? What are the odds that I could breathe? 
that I could smell, that I could stretch, you know. So here's a little contemplative exercise I like. It's brief. So each of us has nine positive qualities, and each of us has one negative quality. So when you heard me say each of us had one negative quality, how did you feel? That negative one was pretty good. Yeah, pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> but did you wonder what that one was? No. And what you were going to do about it? Yeah. In our daily life, I would say that I will, then you, you, you ruined the exercise because you're all very oriented towards it. Yeah. Optimism. But most people, when they hear that, they're like, oh shit, you know, one <laughs> negative quality, you know? And, but for most of us, you know, any given moment when we're struggling with something, I, the positive qualities in our life are almost always outnumbering the negative ones. Sometimes at the same, though. The equal amount, you think? No, I mean, like, your, your greatest strength can also be your greatest oh, weakness. Yeah, yeah, okay. That's getting more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but if you don't see the positive qualities that are present in your life, you might as well not have them. You know? You, and sometimes we treat like, um, it's kind of like having paintings in a closet. You know, it doesn't do you any good, really. Um, so, uh, to, so this practice is to not focus on the, on the, you know, sometimes they say the squeaky wheel gets the grease or whatever like that. And that's true with how we're relating to what's, what's manifesting in our lives. Mm -hmm. That will be kind of at a loss. You know, I, the other day, oh, I went to, uh, I have this fascination with fake Mexican food. It's kind of my favorite kind of food when there's just like careful, the plate's hot and it's just like an ocean of red and yellow. And, um, and, um, I went to uh, California, I hate to tell you this, but I hope you know, it is fake Mexican food, but California tacos, because I'm limited to what I can walk to. So I went to California tacos, which is right over there, because right right it was on diners, drive-ins, and dives. Um, and they had it playing on loop when you go in there. <laughs> That's money, or whatever. Um, and there was a family, um, across from me, and I was trying not to be like the creepy guy by myself, like staring at the family. But there was like a little girl with glasses, and I mean, little kids with glasses are already like a winner. Um, and she was like really nice to her mom. She like really liked her mom. And they were really excited about the food that they got. When the little tacos came out, they were like, whoa, you know? And I remember thinking like, I hope these people, I hope it's registering to these people, like how cute this family. You know, and, um, and you know, my grandparents just died earlier this year, and they died like five days of her career. And, um, and uh, I spent so much time in that house. That house is the most consistent thing in my life. And um, now my aunt and uncle, my least favorite uncle, um, they live in the house. And it's like, Oh, it's all, all the little porcelain ducks are going to be gone. You know, the picture of Joe DiMaggio and Marilyn Monroe on their wedding day that's framed in black and white is going to be gone. Because my, my grandfather's mother was Joe DiMaggio's cousin. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> and so, like, there's a lot of Joe DiMaggio. And actually, my grandpa kind of looked like Joe DiMaggio. Um, so there's, like, Joe DiMaggio and paraphernalia and stuff. Because um, he's our boy. And... Uh, and I'm just like, oh, that's all over. And I knew it was going to be over. You would have told me conceptually I would have understood that it was going to be over. But I didn't do, I didn't contemplate that it was going to be over. Because it's so easy, you know, um, to think about the camaraderie that I had with my friends when I was 19. And be like, oh, that's gone and never returning. You know, um, you know, the experience of, like, especially for me, the experience of, like, uh, New love and stuff like that. That's kind of the thing that I'm not gonna probably not gonna experience. You know, all these things that uh, uh, and and the optimism and buoyancy that I used to have. You know, and and to think, gosh, I'd really like to go. And there's this fascination with kind of going back in time and reliving certain moments. You know, going to meet Archimedes or whatever. <laughs> um, 
And uh, I think that's because um, we don't realize that we're living in history right now. You know, these are the days that we're going to live in history. At some point. And when you just said now, that was history. Yeah, yeah. Seconds ago. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and I'll think back about, I'm already reminiscing about the, the family having dinner yesterday. And I want to come, do you know your family's beautiful? Yeah. Um, so, uh, unrecognized qualities might as well not exist. You know, so to make it part of your practice to recognize the qualities of your precious. Um, and then the second thought that turns the mind towards the Dharma is so that we don't just get excited about, well, Zen's about appreciating life, appreciating life. I know how to do that, game over. It's not just that, it's the impermanence. And that's so that it doesn't become an evil trick. Yeah. About rewarding yourself for being a person. Yeah. And there's two kinds of impermanence in the Buddhist tradition. There's what we call the subtle impermanence or the momentary impermanence, and then the gross, continuous impermanence. Um, and so the subtle is that there's subtle changes going by moment by moment. So I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but you are uh, coming to the Zendo, you're like, this cushion looks good. <laughs> you know, and you sit down and you're like, I'm good. I could do this for half an hour. You know, and then all of a sudden you realize that you're like this, you know, or one foot's asleep or something like that. And it's just like, there's no, there's no position you can be in that's going to be continuously satisfied. Mm -hmm. You know, any position that you could be in is going to be agonizing. The best you're going to get is 90 minutes. But for most of us, it's about 25, 30, if we're, if we're lucky. You know, for some of us, it's 10 to 15. Or about 20. <laughs> that's why when I do retreats, I keep it at, I keep the zazen periods at 25 so that you don't have this relationship that Zazen is this agonizing, grueling kind of marathon. So if you get up to do Kingham more often, you stay fresher throughout the day. You know? Um, so there's the subtle changes moment by moment, but then there's the continuous impermanence that, that's just like, and hey, we're gonna die. There's no way out of this alive. You know? What a fucker. <laughs> you know? So, um, so in Buddhist tradition and most of the yoga traditions, one of the most important practices to, is to just be aware that this is, uh, it's a rental. <laughs> you know? and, and, and with that in mind and looking back, all these ups and you could, you could kind of temper that understanding with the ups and downs of life, making them a little bit more colorful rather than these massive, you know, catastrophic. Or, or yeah. we may not have our friends and family. It may not be us. We might let that be transition. Yeah, and, being, and so being aware, and this is, so that, you know, all these practices kind of relate to each other. So I'm talking about impermanence. It could also sound like that precious human rebirth, too, of the appreciation of the time that you have with folks, you know? And that so many times people, you know, like, uh, think of things that they wish they would have told someone. Mm -hmm. And like, what are the reasons to not tell someone, right. you know? Um, and so when we're faced with challenging situations, knowing that everything is constantly in flux can help that quite a bit, you know? So sometimes like, you know, I, I did a, the first, actually where I got the idea for the shorter periods was I did a session in India right after I got ordained and they were 25 minute periods. And I remember sitting down and having the very familiar feeling of having to pee. Uh -huh. And I'm just like, it's 25 minute period, it's okay. You know, I, I can handle this. It's not that, it's not going to become an ignorable kidney stone, like, you know, like gnarly problem in 25 minutes, I think. So I'll be able to go pee in a little bit, you know? And like, that's kind of true when we're face to face with all of these things. You know, there's the, the tunnel ends. Um, and that's its nature. One time um, I went to my teacher, Kosho at Del Sahara, and I, complained about some kind of issue I was having. And he said, well, when you filled out the application, did you check the box that said the full treatment? You know, um, because like, what I was experiencing was what it's like to live in a monastery. It just is. You know, and what we're experiencing is, is what it's like to be a person. Or at least what it's like to be us. And we can compare ourselves to other people and be like, well, that person doesn't have that problem. And it's like, maybe, maybe not. Don't know for sure. Um, and 
that doesn't matter. You can't trade with anyone. You've got you've inherited your situation. You know, and you can't wish yourself out of it. You know, so we're working with what's in front of us right now, whatever our predicament is. So that's number two, impermanence. Number three is karma. Um, so I think I quoted the Bhagavad Gita correctly yesterday when I said there's this line that says something like, um, the totality of your habits are what makes your character. And sometimes I think that there's something kind of different than that, you know? And you hear people be like, I know I did that terrible thing, but I'm really a good person. It's like, well, what's the difference there? You know, what are we apart from how we treat people, what we're bringing into our lives all the time, and how and how we act under pressure? You know, what training do we fall back to? Okay. And so, um, and then the second part of that quote is like the totality of your habits is what makes your character, and your habits arise due to what you due to the bend of your mind. And this is where practice comes in. Like, there's no bend of your mind towards or away from anything that isn't going to have an impact of your felt experience in your life. And that's what karma basically means. It's not so much like you reap what you sow. I mean, that's kind of a simplification. But it's kind of like, you know, the way that we're engaging with our life as it is arising is what is creating the mind that we're going to have. So aversion enacted is aversion cemented you know, anchored in. You know, warmth and active, you try it on. So we're trying on being the person that we want to be. You know, and, and there's a story that Dakota Sawaki teaches. As he says, um, um, the Buddha gave a teaching and there were 500 arhats and there were 500 people pretending to be arhats. Mm -hmm. And by the end of the teaching, there were a thousand arhats. Mm -hmm. An arhat means like an awakened person. Um, so, uh, in order to create the future that we want to create, taking into account that um, there's no way of bypassing the impact of what we're doing all the time. What is this? Oh, and so in that vein, um, oversimplifying your practice to make it kind of this uh, one direction thing, well, I'm just gonna sit upright and I'm gonna sit still. It doesn't quite, that's kind of like if you put the seed in the ground, but you don't water it, you don't weed around it, you don't make sure that it's getting the right amount of sunlight or not too much or not too little, you gotta create the other conditions. This is about creating the other conditions because Zazen alone, I hate to tell you, is not, does not a Buddhist make. Um, and it's, it's, it's it doesn't, uh, if this is, this is about making uh, your life, you know, Buddha's whole thing, and the whole thing of the Shramana movement, all the yogis of, of, of South Asia going back uh, 2,500 years ago, so not just Buddhism, there are all these other schools. Buddhism survived well and had the most, was the earliest to be kind of codified and written there, or at least the only school to be codified. And written they had a lot of contemporaries, but all of them shared the same kind of question, and it's kind of, Given that we're going to die, what, what is it that makes life worth living? What's the compelling thing about being a person? You know? And so but it's like the compelling thing about being a person is how great it can be when you're not confused about what it is. And so the whole process is about you know, opening yourself up to how great it can be when you're not confused about what it is. And so, um, your practice doesn't have to be this kind of arduous thing. It should be kind of nourishing you as you go, I would say. Um, Can I ask a question? Yeah. So we had a teacher here that was like, you know, you must sit. And it was like, you know, the whip. What, where does that come from? Because you're saying something completely different. And so yeah, it, was it because maybe people were really hard on him in the monasteries? you must sit i mean it was like you know sitting was like god almost yeah that happens damn divine now i've never i i encountered it a lot you know um and uh people are weird <laughs> um <laughs> and it might that might but well okay so one of the things i try to try on is that everybody lives in a universe that makes perfect sense to them 
<laughs> you know, and in that person's universe, that makes perfect sense to them. And they got friends that that makes sense to, and they had teachers that that made sense to. And that's the thing that really unlocked it for them. One time, I was watching a documentary about Mormons. Mm -hmm. And there was a lady that did not grow up Mormon, but, the, you know, a couple of teenagers knocked on her door one day in little short sleeve dress shirts. Um, the elders. The elders. Elder, elder, I'm they're Elder Sammy, elders. I'm 18. They're called elders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> and uh, they gave me the Book of Mormon, and the first line of the Book of Mormon is, I am Nephi, born of goodly family, or something like that. And she just started weeping. And she's like, I knew I found my practice. I knew I found my life. so pr yeah. proselytizing door to door works then. Apparently. Well, I'm here sometimes, <laughs> you know. Um, but it's uh, but there's something about whatever was going on with her and that in that word goodly family or something like that that just you know did something for her. So some people um, encounter a very orthodox presentation of Zen, which is not you know when we talk about authenticity, it's very hard because all this stuff is fluctuating. You know, things are impermanent. It's very hard to put your finger on, on any point and saying this is authentic. You know, you can't, you know, uh, Bodhidharma, you can say, oh, well, Bodhidharma, that, that, he really started Zen. It's like, you don't even know he was existed. You know, he might have just been a composite. So there's all of these assumptions about what the authentic original practice might have been. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you got to sit, you got to sit is... Um, a way of uh, a very common East Asian, not so much Chinese, but more Japanese kind of exhortation. And I think there's a, so we got to look at what, what were the cultural motivations? What did it mean to be a man in Japan in the 20th century? You know, what did it mean to um, be clergy? What kind of um, affect did they have? What kind of impression were they trying to make? You know, and I could be, someone could hear me and be like, well, you're really not undercutting the sincerity of what this means to these people. You know, and I, I probably am because I don't, I don't, I never understood that world. You know, I don't think this should harm you. I don't think it should destroy your knees. Mm -hmm. I don't think it should make you tired. Um, when one of my current teachers, uh, Mingyu Rinpoche, um, someone asked him, uh, uh, "What? How do I keep myself from falling asleep?" And he goes, "Oh, just sleep, you know." <laughs> you know so i mean some people like the, my take is just gonna be like that ain't it that's that's gen z even though i'm not gen z but like that's like kids and that's that's this new that's this new frou-frou pc everything should be nice kind of zen you know or I mean, that's social justice <laughs> or whatever and i'm like sure great i'll take it that's that's the mountain that i'm gonna die you know, I want it, I want this stuff to be accessible. I want this stuff to be relevant. I want it to not make your life worse, you know, and I want you to not feel like you're under anybody's thumb, you know, and that you owe that you owe it to some kind of tradition or some heavenly fathers to love something that is agonizing. You know, how do you make it relevant? Um, how does it enrich you? Isn't that what you were here for? And it's, and it's amazing the way our minds can change from when we come to a place like this with an open mind and we're curious and we have suffering that we want to address and then we get slowly, slowly, slowly kind of indoctrinated to where we're kind of like scolding people for not doing the thing right or, or, or teaching people like not to move and stuff like that. And it's like, it's amazing how quickly that open-hearted newbie it gets kind of solidified into being a uh, proponent of an orthodoxy for the orthodoxy sake, without really kind of checking in. You know, I spent a lot of time in my monastery being like, uh, is this benefiting any of these folks? And I have a question about that yeah. because I, I, we were, I was taught by, by a very orthodox person. And, you know, to, you know I had kind of have a love-hate with, with that, you know. Mm -hmm. But I do understand the, what it means to have a spiritual discipline. And I always yeah. saw it as discipline rather than following your wants and your needs and your egos. But he yeah. would sit there and say, if you scratched your nose, yeah, don't yeah. scratch, you know, and he had this big booming voice and he was yeah. six foot five and, yeah. you know, very, very intimidating, you yeah. know. So what is, what is your take on, on, the, on yeah. the spiritual discipline versus f following your, your ego and yeah. your okay. preferences? Yeah. So I think we have to orient ourselves to what our ultimate agenda is. You know, and it's okay to have an agenda. We're lying to ourselves if we say that there is no agenda. 
We gotta hold it very, very lightly and not be attached to the outcomes. Right. Okay. But we are oriented towards something, otherwise we wouldn't be doing this. You know? Um, now, if the ultimate, I would say the ultimate agenda of this practice for me, the way I describe it is, I'm discerning appearance and reality, and I'm meeting everything with love. Not discerning appearance from reality, because they're not always opposed to each other. You know, but, but examining appearance, examining reality. Sometimes they overlap, sometimes they don't. You know, sometimes the appearance makes sense, even if it's not as reality, because it means something to my conditioning, to my system. And taking into, you know, taking into consideration why things mean to me what they do, being able to sidestep that when it's important to you, you know? And then meeting everything with love. You know, and I think there's a way that um, discipline means different things for different people, and a lot of people don't really recognize that. Because if you have a certain positionality where what, you, what was proffered to you by your teacher was something that you could do, you know, and sometimes you were kind of socially rewarded for being able to do what your teacher asked you. You know, so there's a lot of times that I see at the monasteries, I see the teachers kind of having favorites of the people that remind them of themselves. Mm -hmm. That's something that you see. There is no equity in karmic affinity, you know. Um, so, um, so you have this kind of mill where it's actually a replication mill, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, and what that teacher fails to take into account and what I failed to take into account in my early years of training is that everybody is coming from a very, very different place. And if they're having a different experience of you, they're not lying and they're not faking it. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, <laughs> um, and so the people that move through the ranks are the people that are rewarded by the system as they encountered it, you know? And then, um, and to them, it's like, well, yeah. This is how you do it, you know, and um, and all the people that couldn't do it weren't cut out for it. It's not that the system ever failed them; it's that they weren't cut out for it, mm -hmm. you know. And there's a story of um, uh, Edo Shimano, I think, who turned out to be kind of this guy. But um, but uh, he said, uh, I. I'm like a mother tiger. I don't know if mother tigers really do this. Because I throw my cubs off the cliff and see if they can climb back up or something like that. You know, and it's referring to how he treats his students, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, and Barry Manjit, who I think was at the lecture, goes, I'll start my Zen center at the bottom of the cliff. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So there is something about discipline, but having your discipline being aligned with what with what you're oriented towards. Okay. You know. Um, and that's what it means to you, discipline? Yeah, yeah, and I think, but I think there's discipline, and, and taking an inventory about, are you, have, is, is what you're putting your eggs into having the impact that you originally wanted it to have, or that, you know, because I, um, you know, I did 10 years at the San Francisco Zen Center, I did um, maybe like six of the 90 day ongos at Tassajara, so that's like, 25 session or something like that, but I was 30. Um, and then when I was in my early 30s, I went to a yoga ashram to learn how to become a yoga teacher, and I did yoga asana. And I was like, no one told me. No one told me that my body could feel good, you know, and that I could feel like I belong on this earth, and I could feel like I deserve to be here, you know? because it wasn't part of the recipe book of, of, the, of the institution that I was part of. You know, so teachers know what they know and they don't know what they don't know. Um, and they're gonna be giving you usually what worked for them. And you have to right. see if, if, that, if, that, if that accords with your interests or not. You know, sometimes you discover that it doesn't accord with your interests, I try, you know? But you're the, you're, the, you're the final authority, you know? And hopefully you encounter a teacher that lets you know, lets you believe. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, and then the last, I got my way over, the last um, thought that turns the mind towards the Dharma is the suffering of samsara, which is an important one. Um, and that is just to like 
let ourselves recognize, this is very similar to the impermanence of subtle impermanence, but just letting ourselves recognize that um, the reward system that we keep trying to participate in has never quite delivered the way that we anticipated it to. Yeah. Have you ever gotten something that you wanted? Raise your hand if you've gotten something that you wanted. Did it deliver for you the ways that you anticipated that it would be? Not always. <laughs> the marriage, the driver's license, the meal, the house, job. the job, you know, all of the, if only I can, you know, and once I do, you know, the degree, you know, and, and that kind of postponing the arrival into your life, you know? I'm going to, and Coach o, my DJ, when we were in Austin, there was this one problem after another. And he, oh, and he used to go, we're almost there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in terms of things working out, we're almost there. So I don't know about you, but I've, almost, I've often, I spent most of my life thinking, either I'm almost there or, gosh, I don't know how to even get there. And it turns out that's what life's made of, all of those moments where you're anticipating it. You know? So, so really, establishing the self on the self and realizing that we're in it, this is it. Actually, a lot of us are halfway done or more, more than halfway done. You know? And um, it's not a dress rehearsal. And, and, and the things that we think are going to deliver are not the things that deliver. The things that deliver are usually an inside job. The extent to which they're an outside job is the environment that we create by being settled on ourselves and not being ambitious. It being these, uh, a beacon of love, which you don't hear in the sense of But, uh, you know, understanding appearance and reality and being loving. And being what? Loving. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's okay. I'll say it twice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I went over by quite a bit, but I, I think I'm kind of done. But do we have, I mean, what happens next? Uh, questions usually or comments? Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, we got ready okay, for that. Shoot. Any thoughts, reflections, comments? Yeah. Were you mm -hmm. raising your hand or were you? Well, I wasn't, but I will. Okay. Okay, there, there is a quote that has always been near and dear to me, and it comes from Dogen, of course, and it says, the Zazen I speak of is not learning meditation. Yeah. It is the Dharma gate of repose and bliss. It is yeah. the practice realization of total accumulated enlightenment. Yeah. Snares cannot bring it. It is the manifestation of the ultimate reality. Absolutely. And, and, and the way I was trained in that was like, the kind of presentation was, see, this really is great. And if you don't experience it as great, you got to try hard because you, you're just not getting something. What am I not getting? I don't know. I'm not going to tell you. You know, just trust it. Just, you know, be do the thing that doesn't work more. Or something like that. You well, know, like and, you know. Yeah, but no, I think I think it's I think it's important because it can be that. So that could be the calling that we're working on. It's like if this is a Dharma Gate of Repose and Bliss, what 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 does effort look like? What is what does effort look like in repose and bliss? What role does effort play in repose and bliss? You know, is it something that's at the end of a of a, of a tunnel of strain, you know? So I would say to really, if we're gonna really take Dogen to heart, when you come in here and you sit down, don't meditate. Don't worry about it. Don't worry, don't worry about self-improvement. You can think about adjusting your life in ways that you think will be beneficial when you're not in here, you know? But when you're in here and you're sitting down, don't meditate, you don't have to watch your breath, you don't have to stay up, stay up straight, just, 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 Know that what you're experiencing is it, you know? And then there's a certain kind of recognition that can happen where what that means, that it, that it's the same, but what it means to you is experience very different. Because you're like, this thing that's been going on all along is the nature of mine, is the luminous of mine. And that was a bit on the side from the regular topic, but we're going to get more of that next weekend. Yeah. Um, so I'm not. So, so maybe you're a Yeah. Um, 
So he's done three years. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's, he did three year retreat when he was 13. <laughs> he started when he was 13. Yeah. So why did he spend that time in meditation as opposed to doing something relish? You know. Yeah. 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 He had to. That was that was the Dharma position that he was born into. You know, you're born a Rinpoche, you do a three year retreat. You know? Um and um so it's up to you. And like when I was when I was twenty three, I had to go to Japan. No one was gonna talk me in. And all the San Francisco Zen Center teachers were like, You don't have to go to Japan. What are you trying to do? You know, and they use all their little lines. What is the use of going up here and there to practice? Yeah. Just quoting the scripture. And, yeah. and I'm like, I'm going to Japan, you know? Um, and I went to Japan, and I was like, oh, Jesus. That wasn't, that wasn't helpful. You know, and I actually snuck out after seven days. Um, this is 2005. So I had like three dokusons with Tongue and Harada. Um, and I was just kind of like, and everybody's like, Tangan Harada Roshi, he's the greatest Zen master, the last living true teacher, blah, 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 but Kokiji is the only place left where you can join in the way. And, I, and I'm 23 years old, and I go, and I'm like, it kind of feels like Tassahara, but in Japan, with macho men, <laughs> which always stresses me out. Um, I get very uncomfortable around um, boys being boys. Mm -hmm. um, so, and some people are like a pig in the mud around boys being boys. So mm -hmm. they think, like, of course, this is great, man. We're doing weird shit here. Have each other <laughs> back and stuff, you know? Um, and uh, I was, I don't know if it's because I'm queer or, or um, because I was young or uh, because of my childhood and, you know, getting thrown trash cans in the locker room, but I needed to get out of there as soon as I could, you know? Um, and, uh, Oh, anyway, that, I, I started talking to Tom and I started to address the issue. But sometimes it takes an engagement with that too. And sometimes people, there's all kinds of accounts. People say I did retreat, it was the most life-changing thing in the world. People say I did retreat to find out that I never had to do retreat, but how would I have found out unless I did retreat? Mm -hmm. You know, I sit here and I'm like, I, do what you do, but let a little red light go off if you feel like you're a problem that needs to be solved, you know, and if the and if the retreat thing or the sashimi thing or the monk thing or the monastery thing or the moving into the Zen center or taking Jukai is all a response to this idea that I'm a problem that needs to be solved with lots of meditation, I think I think you can address that by something a little bit more acute than sitting still. It needs to be a little bit of an orientation shift there about how we're regarding ourselves, and that can be done a little bit more dialectically. Than samadhi, I think the samadhi might not even touch it. Yeah. Uh, just quickly, thank you. This was exactly what I wanted to hear. So oh, thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. Great. Thanks. This is exactly what I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, and then and then I'll be laying in bed tonight and be like, oh shit, that was a bad job. So in, in using these four thoughts, um, I'm interested in the mechanics and how this works on the emotion. Yeah. Or maybe, you know, is it um, mindset or bending of the mind that you do every day regardless of where you are? Yeah. Um, well, I always think of the cushion or the retreat or something as a little, as the little lab, but it's the lab for how you relate to the world. You know, so you're in this little controlled environment where you get to rehearse how you're going to relate to notions arising and how you're going to relate to the feeling of the universe. You know, um, so you get to um, try it in kind of like a somewhat safe environment where you're not responding necessarily to things arising from outside of you, you're just finding things arising inside of you. So it's a little bit contained in you, you know? Um, but I think 
you know, I think in the Zen tradition, a lot of the teaching is like, there's this thing called Zen, and it, I already said this, but it's like, there's a thing called Zen, and it, and it has nothing to do with any kind of conceptuality, you know? And I think uh, non-conceptual meditation is something that can be used like um, gamasio or salt. It doesn't have, you don't want to, you don't need to sit down and have a bowl of gamasio, you know, but it's something that you're going to pepper in on your daily life and pepper in on other contemplative practices if you come to the point where you've decided that they're going to be beneficial. You know, so you say, you know what? I've been doing Zazen as I was taught it for X amount of years. You know, you can be happy with the way it's going. You can be, you could think this is interesting. You could be like, I'm going to, when I remember to, contemplate my precious human birth while I'm sitting Zazen. And it could be nature of mind, nature of mind, sitting upright, letting delusion be, letting thoughts come and go. How amazing it is to feel the felt sensation of inhalation and exhalation. Nature of mind, nature of mind. What are the odds of you being a person? Nature of mind, nature of mind, and it's not going to last forever. Nature of mind, nature of mind, karma is unavoidable. Nature of mind. Yeah. So you can just make a little tapestry that way. You have solid rugs and you can have design rugs. And you can have, you know, it's, it's your practice. But um, one size doesn't fit all, and one medicine doesn't address all illnesses. Okay. Okay. So, is there anybody online? Oh, with, yeah. Oh, okay, we got Max. Hi. First off, thank you for your talk. There was a lot I really appreciated hearing in it. Um, I was hoping that you could briefly list the uh, four thoughts that you mentioned. I loved all the context, but it's kind of easy to lose a thread. So. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, and I did it kind of, um, I, I certainly weaved my way mm -hmm. to them. So, uh, for, so if you look up four thoughts that turn the mind towards the Dharma, this is day one Tibetan Buddhism. This is like the thing that you learn instead of Zazen instruction in Tibetan Buddhism. Um, precious human life is number one. Impermanence is number two. Karma is number three. And the suffering of samsara is number four. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? What's the fourth one? I've never so, so samsara is this Buddhist technical term that just means like the cycle of dissatisfaction. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 the world. Yeah. How do we turn that around? <laughs> yeah, that's the whole. That's the whole premise. That's the whole premise. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Everybody satisfied? Yes. Oh. Okay. Uh -huh. okay. Do we sing a song? Sing, yeah. yeah. <clears throat>